Hey, what's up guys? I am Joe from Workbench, and this week we're going to kick off a multi-part tutorial on rigging objects in After Effects. So we're going to build various rigs of different types for different things, and even though I've presented them this way, they're really meant to be kind of open-ended, and so you can kind of pick and choose whatever you want to use on your particular rig. There's a lot of basic just pick whipped expressions in this thing. So if you really want to know about how everything in this thing is built, I would suggest you grab the project file from our website for a dollar. It contains pretty much everything, including the Illustrator files that I built all this stuff off of, all of the expressions, everything you see here. And this isn't exactly how I would build this forklift. It's mainly just an example. We're going to have a part two to this video that's going to go over how I would actually build this, especially if I were doing a bunch of different models. But I mainly built this thing to show you what can be done. But just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Thanks again. Anyway, let's get on with this cube. I've built various implementations of this rig in the past, but this one came from a recent project where I needed to keep the strokes constant and I had a lot of isometric cube shaped things. Although this can work for a lot of different isometric objects as long as the top and the bottom edge work, so it's kind of cool. You can see what I'm talking about if we move this transition slider. As we get to 100 and actually get to 100, it goes away completely flat. And this is a pretty simple rig where we have a mat that is shaped like the bottom here so that this object really just passes down into it. And then we just have a copy of our edge over top of everything. So you can see if we turn this off, we just have the line there. So that kind of masks everything perfectly. And you can bring this thing in and out as you want to. I've done this for like buildings and different things where you can actually have this be like super tall so that you can actually just make this thing go all the way up or down or whatever you want and have various different sizes. And that one's a pretty simple expression. So if we bring this up into here, you can see that we have Y set to that slider and we're multiplying it by this value, 1.085. And I found that basically by turning this thing off and I moved this down until it was where I needed it to be. It happened to be 108.5. So why is it 108.5? Well, that's divided by 100. So basically, instead of dividing the slider by 100 and then multiplying it by 108.5, we're just going to do one step and just multiply it by 1.085. So this slider is basically just going to be the percentage of completion. So then after that, we just take the value that we have and we add an offset array with zero for X because we're not going to change that and then Y. So whatever this value is. So we turn that back on and we're back to where we were. So the other problem you have when you're doing stuff like this is that maybe you want different size cubes or you want different size buildings or whatever they are, but you don't want their stroke width to change because that's kind of, you know, part of your art direction. So an easy way to fix that is to actually do all of your scaling inside this sub comp because of course we're setting these up with master properties. So in here we have a scale controller and you can see that if I scale it up, the size of this stroke does not change. And that's accomplished pretty easily, although I always forget how to do this for some reason because I never remember these parentheses that are in here and they are very important. So don't do like me. Remember the order of operations in this case is very important. So to do that, all we do is we do value, we divide it by our scale slider and we divide that by 100. So where normally you would want to scale something up by multiplying by the controller value as a zero one range, we actually want to divide that so that as the scale gets smaller, the edge and the other strokes on this object get bigger. So if we set this thing to 50 and our stroke was two, we'd want it to be four now because this thing is also going to get scaled down. So we need to scale it up by the opposite amount. And that is how that works. So let's set that back to 100, set this guy back to zero. Not that it matters because it's in a master property, but anyway, that's that. So then we're going to look at our forklift. And this is where all hell breaks loose. So what I've built in here is basically two different views of this forklift, one going in this direction and one going in the opposite direction. From that, if I change this controller around, we can actually rotate to every direction by flipping things. So that's pretty cool. But this thing is also built in other crazy fashions where you could basically change this cab color to other colors that are far uglier than what I have set. Or you can change the color of pretty much everything else. And we're doing that with these layers I'm calling luminosity layers. And they're just set to overlay. If we solo one of these things in the direction that we're actually facing, uh, like this one, and we turn this off so that you can actually see it better. You can see this is what we're overlaying. I included that all for one tiny expression that I might as well show you guys first because I think it's pretty cool. So we have these colors in here and everything is linked across the whole thing. All of these things have colors that are linked. Like if you actually look at the expressions on these things, there's expressions on everything. They're all linked. I did them all by hand. Fun times. Anyway, let's take a look at the ones that are in here because they're quite interesting. I love this expression because it's clever and simple, and so it's kind of beautiful in its execution. So the basic premise is that we're using a checkbox to control our lighting so we can flip it from one side to the other. Since the checkbox can be zero or one in value, we're gonna set a keyframe at zero seconds and a keyframe at one second so we can basically flip between the two. 
In this particular case, we had to flip it because of how this thing is built so that it makes sense. Although you could just flip the keys and do whatever. But this also allows us to use another one of my favorite little expressions. So let's take a look. First, we're setting up a variable called check. And you can see we're bringing in this checkbox here called even. And that's on our controller. And since we want to invert the value of that, we're going to do one minus the value that we have in the checkbox. And then since we have zero or negative one, we just take the absolute value of that. So we again have zero and one. And then after that, all we do is this property dot value at time check. So it's either zero or one. So we either get this first keyframe or the second keyframe. And that is what allows us to swap the lighting so that we can maintain it from one side or the other when the object is scaled the other direction. And if you actually notice, because of the way this is curved, I picked different things for some of the angles. So if we actually go over here and rotate this thing, you can see that this thing becomes dark, this thing becomes bright, but if we're in different angles like up here, this thing is super bright. So you can actually use those keyframes to make it do all sorts of different stuff. Or if you had that cube, for example, you could have a cube that's red or a cube that's blue, and you can just do different keys. And you can have a simple checkbox that lets you pick one or the other. So it's just an interesting way that you can do that. You could do the same thing with a slider if you wanted to have multiple values or whatever. The simple fact that you can set a keyframe at zero or one and switch to them using a checkbox using zero or one is pretty cool. So let's go down the rabbit hole. As you've seen, we have this angle control that lets us control the angle of this thing. I wanted to show you something else that's interesting. And I find that this makes it easier to determine which direction this thing is going to point in. Because if you just had a slider from like zero to three, how do you know which angle you start with? Like, are you going to start with this one pointing this way? You're going to start with one pointing up and to the right. But this is pretty clear. The downside is that when we link this as a master property, this angle control just becomes the top part and it doesn't have this angle in there. But if we look in the thumbnail that I've done here, the example stuff for that, I've actually put an angle control back in here to control these things. Because I find that to be way more helpful and it's also easier than digging through master properties in the timeline. I've also done one in here for lift completion, which we'll take a look at in a little bit. So let's go back and let's look at what that actually does. So there's no expression on the angle control. It's just helping to drive the other controls that we're using. So other stuff on here is derived from this. Basically, we have this thing here called side, right? And this guy has an expression in here that we're gonna pull up into expressionist. So you can see here, we set A equal to that angle control and we modulo that by 360. So we can go past 360. So basically it's gonna lop off this rotations number because all we care about is the actual angle it's facing, not how many times it's rotated. So in our next line, we're gonna do if A is less than zero, so if it's a negative value, we're gonna add 360 to that. And that's just to make sure that we're back into a positive equivalent because a negative angle in After Effects is going to be like, like let's say this is negative 43. That's actually going to be this when you do like an absolute value to it or whatever. So it would be facing the wrong direction. So doing that just basically makes sure that we're back over here. Like this should be like 200 and something if you were to rotate around positively. So then I want a number from zero to one again. So we're going to do A divided equals, and that just means A equals A divided by, and then we have 360. So then we'll have some number between zero and one, and we're gonna multiply that by four so that our range will be zero to four. However, we're never actually gonna to get to four because four would have to be 360 itself, and with our modulus, that's actually gonna just be zero. So our range will actually be zero to three. But we can end up with a fractional number like 3.2, and I just want integers here, so we're gonna do math.floor of a times four. So that lets us know which side we're gonna pick. So because of how I've set this up, I have one actual drawing of this way. This is a flipped drawing of the one that goes this way. And then this is flipped at the first one that I showed you. So basically every other one needs to be scaled negatively. So because of that, we have this slider called even, and this is not in our master property. It's just in here for calculations, but we check the side slider and we modulo that by two. And if we have a value, so we have like a remainder of one, then obviously it's not even because it's either one or three. So we're going to set the checkbox to zero. Otherwise we're going to set the checkbox to one. So it's either going to be checked or unchecked. So if it's odd, it's unchecked. If it's even, it's checked. So this even checkbox handles everything that flips in this thing from the scaling to the lighting and things like that. And then we have one other checkbox and it's called upper. And that basically determines whether we're facing up or down. And that's because initially I was thinking about it. And I was like, oh, I could just invert every other time. I could, I could turn one, one set of these things on or off, but I didn't really think about it. And the two middle ones are actually in order. So that one is just the inverse of this one. And the other two are also inverses of each other. So they don't follow an on off pattern. So it's on, on, off, off, right? Or whatever. So this one's a little more complex, but not a lot. We're just gonna set I equal to the side slider. And then we're gonna check if it's zero or if it's three, this checkbox will be one. So that'll be the top. So those will be the upper two. And if it's one or two, 
it'll be the bottom two. So then we're going to set that checkbox to zero. So it is not the upper. And throughout this whole thing, that controls whether things are turned on or off. So if we go into uh, like this thing, for example, and we hit T, we can bring this up. Basically, this one looks at the upper checkbox since this is one of the upper pieces. And it just multiplies that value by 100. So if the checkbox is zero, it's not an upper layer. So zero times 100 is zero, so it'll be off. If it is an upper layer, it'll be one for the checkbox. And that'll multiply by 100 and we'll have it on. So that's how all of those work. And then if we look at one of the bottom ones, we bring this guy up. It's just going to be inverted of that. So we're going to do that one minus the value trick. In this case, we're just going to subtract either a one or a zero. So that'll just flip what value of this is. So we multiply that by 100. And then those will turn on or off. The scale of this thing is similar, except for we need a range that's a little bit different. So we just grab that even checkbox value. Because again, remember that one flips between each one. So if it's zero or two, the scale will be 100. Otherwise, it's negative 100. And then we just return x comma 100 because the y value is always going to be 100. So that's how all of those are done. And then we only have one thing that's not just a simple linking of colors. And that is this slider called lift. And this goes to a maximum of 100. And that makes that go all the way up there. So what's extra cool about this is that the back two pieces don't move until this thing comes all the way to the top. Or at least roughly around the top. So you can see if we bring that down. And now it starts moving once we get past 40 or so. And this could actually keep going past it if you really wanted it to. These won't because they're locked to a value, but that one's not. You could limit it that way if you wanted to. Um, sometimes I leave it this way just because maybe you want just a little bit more and who knows, you, you know, I feel like you're smart enough to figure out that 100 is going to be the maximum. And once this thing starts separating from there, if you don't notice that, that's kind of on you. So let's set this back to zero and let's look at how those things are built. That's all really right in here in these nulls. Every set of forks, every set of the lifts, all of them are all linked to their equivalent pieces on this null. So what's nice is that no matter what direction our forklift is facing, the forks are gonna move up by the same amount. So we can just parent them all to a couple of nulls. So let's take a look at the forks thing here. We're gonna hit EE to bring up its expression and then we'll bring it into expressionist. So you can see this is kind of a riff on some of the other things that we've done like with the cube. And in this case, I actually did have the divided by here, but you could just have this multiplied by eight. I was still messing around with values I think when I built this, so I didn't do that. But it's the same thing. We grab our lift slider. We divide it by 100 to get a range of 0 to 1, and we multiply that by 800. Anyway, then it's pretty much the same thing, except for we're not going to add value to this one because we're not going to sink it into the ground. We want this lift to go up. So we're going to subtract an offset array that's going to be 0 for the x, so 0 comma y, and that's it. So we're going to take whatever our value was, and we're going to subtract our new y value. So that one's pretty simple. So this moves independently of anything else. Nothing is looking at it. It just moves up, depending on that slider, up to 800 pixels. So the stage one and stage two have the same type of expression on them because they're kind of supposed to move together. So let's bring up one of these. You can see again, we're going to take Y and we're going to set it equal to that lift slider. So then we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to set Y equal to the E's as the Y value, which is the slider, goes from 30 to 100. Then we're going to go from zero to 300. So this thing is going to move by 300, but it's going to wait until our slider passes 30. Then it's going to slowly ease out of there and then it's going to ease back in at the end too. I initially had this set to linear instead of ease, which is probably closer to how it works in an actual forklift. But when I did my GIF at the beginning, when it went so fast, it would just start popping instead of like smoothly animating up. So I changed it to do that. And it's not really something you'd notice. And the popping was worse. So that's what I did. And we're just going to subtract that new offset from value just like we did before. And that'll move that one up. The other one has the exact same expression. The reason why they move differently is that one is linked to the other. So you can see stage one is linked to main, right? Which is the main null for this whole thing. And that's because main controls the horizontal scaling. And then stage two is linked to stage one. So stage two, which is the one that goes higher, is going to also move up an extra 300 with the rest of it. So this whole rig will move up 600 and this thing will move up 800. And then you have a forklift that works. And for people that ask about the thumbnail, this is basically a bunch of these little things arrayed out of here. I used my ISO push to thing from a couple of tutorials back to put them all in place. They all have that lift completion and angle control like we saw in this comp. And they're just set up around here. We got this big one in the middle and then we're using Sapphire Glow on top of it. I was originally gonna use noise on here, but instead I used grain from Red Giant Universe. Then I got a color correction layer on there with Lumetri. We're just using one of the default After Effects Fuji uh, Eterna 250D profiles. Then I got a vignette on top, which is also from Boris FX. And it all comes together to uh, do this. And each one of them has a little camera blur and a blur map which uh, you can't see until I do that. There you go. 
and then they're just kind of tweaked with their blur settings and uh, that's pretty much it. Anyway, so that's it for this one. I hope you guys can find ways to use these techniques in the rigs that you'll build. Make sure to keep an eye out for the next tutorial on this topic. We're gonna go over a way to make more complex objects in a better fashion than we did here. As I said before, this is basically just a way to show you the complexity that you can build into a rig if you really want to. Anyway, if you like this video, make sure to subscribe. And if you'd like to help support what we do, check out patreon.com slash workbench. Make sure to keep up with the blog at workbench.tv. And as always, I'm Joe, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Are, are you still here? Go home. Don't you have a family? Not in this industry.